confusion. I think I think Gary had dueling combos with Pepper and with Bryn, and I guess Pe Pepper thought the meeting was canceled. <laughs> Bryn thought you were stepping in for Gary, and we were going to try and um, have a conversation still, just considering that we haven't had one in a while. Um, okay. So, you know. I, I think this is a, are you recording now? Not yet. Okay, well, let's start the recording. Okay. And then we can, I'm, I'm gonna just say a couple things. We'll do the introductories and then um, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Kim. All right, we're getting that rolling. Okay. All right. Uh, well, do we have an agenda that I'm supposed to be looking at? I, I don't. Or is it one topic? Uh, recap I, where we are and what we're gonna do going forward? I, I think that I think that that works because I don't think that there no is a, a formal agenda. The no last didn't need an agenda. Yeah, I don't think anybody gave Nelly an agenda, and, and this is kind of no. to nobody's nobody's fault, you know what I mean, or anything like that. But in the room, we have Nelly Marble and Kyle Harris from the Cannabis Control Board. We have one member of the public listening in, um, Kim Lawson, um, advisory subcommittee member. Stephanie Smith, also advisory subcommittee or advisory member, filling in for Carrie Gear um, today, who is double booked, and we have Sherman Hong, who has provided a lot of comments to the board, um, given his his background and expertise in lab testing, and, and he was invited to to listen in and to provide any comments, Kim. Um, so thank you, Sherman, for being here. Um, I'm going to turn it over to you, Kim. I, I know it's just kind of an update on where things stand. Um, that would be very, um, I think, helpful. We're hoping to have some understanding of where things are for our board meeting on Friday and to help kind of um, go along with the phase one of our scheduled uh, proposed rulemaking plans that are, we're hoping to develop over the course of this coming year, or excuse me, this coming month. So I, you know, uh, I'll start, but I think um, Stephanie can probably fill me in um, better than I know because it was kind of left in Carrie's hand that we agreed that mirroring or with a few adjustments the hemp program um, as has the uh, department of the agency of ag is doing they will continue on that vein as I understand is that correct Stephanie um, yeah my understanding is that the agency's um, cannabis quality control program set up would apply um, and uh, I guess relative to uh, action limits um, and the one what I understand is that maybe the uh, standard operating procedures for taking samples may change or would not be the same not necessarily they would change but they would not be the same as the hemp programs necessarily does that sound and now I'm referring back to Kim does that sound yes, accurate? Yes, that, that okay. is correct as we recapped because we figured, as I got from Carrie, the hemp program as it's working is doing well. And I think, you know, there's a lot of, um, we put a lot of trust in the agency in terms of um, auditing and ensuring that we're getting data of some known quality um, and that the agency laboratory has stepped up to the plate with regards to their programs um, to help with the analyses and things like that. I'm not sure where the certification programs for getting other labs into the program is at this point in time and whether, I mean, I, I high, personally highly recommend that they go to some kind of ISO 17025 accreditation rather than the agency of um, accrediting because it is um, it's hard to keep track of you know if you don't have a standard set of you know quality standards yes yeah, so let me um, let me at least share a little bit about the agency's certification program so the certification project program is it's um, being applied currently is we do require ISO 17025 accreditation um, or at least working towards that accreditation because um, we know that there are some labs that aren't actually accredited at this point in time and it's a fairly big lift. Um, if you're not uh, currently accredited then we limit your testing capabilities and I'm not talking specifically about the HEM program, we limit your testing um, to potency and moisture and maybe pesticides, and that would be uh, on crops. Um, 
Actually, no, you would be able to test potency in a finished product as well, but it's limited what you can test. You can't do molds and, uh, uh, and mycotoxins, aerobic bacteria. You can't do, do pesticide, uh, no solvent analysis. Um, so, so anyway, so we limited it. Uh, right, and you have right. to be, again, you have to be working towards it though. So it doesn't mean that you're not, you know, you gotta start moving. And if after a year there's no progress, then, you know, we would consider the facts around why there's no progress and maybe make a determination whether or not we would allow you to renew your certification with the agency. Um, and so, so we do require that 17025. Right. Generally. Yes. Uh, and then additionally, the certification program looks at how you're reporting the information out in order for us to have some consistency from lab to lab to lab and also to be in compliance with USDA's requirements because we have that added, added layer. Um, right. And reporting on a dry weight basis um, for crops, um, we require reporting on as packaged for products. Um, and uh, so anyway, so we look at that as well. Because again, we want to make sure or, or try to establish an, an apples to apples comparison regardless of the lab that's doing the analysis. Um, so we look at the reporting. Uh, what other things do we look at? Uh, we review your standard operating procedures. We review your um, the people that are working for you. You know, we require some resumes. Um, but it's, it's, fairly, it's fairly rigorous. Um, and, you know, we're ground truthing and also we felt that it would provide, I mean, not only can an individual complain to ISO certification folks concerning that lab's ability to perform, they also have somebody within the state that they can report to because we certified them. And sometimes that conversation can be easier and then we can also work with the accrediting um, agency as well. We can have conversations with them to establish um, what's going on, I guess. Um, we also require some proficiency testing um, by those labs that are certified by us. Uh, but I know accrediting organizations do as well. Um, so that's kind of what, that's just really quick and, and I'll admit I, um, I only learned about this very recently so I'm not entirely Yeah, yeah no, that, that's, that's all I, you know, the summary of that is really excellent, thank you. <laughs> because I, I knew there was some on the hemp side, but I wasn't sure where we were going on all of the cannabis side. You know, the well, I knew there was some on the medical marijuana side as well, but um, yeah, okay. we yeah, yeah, I that, that, what uh, the Department of Public Safety requires or doesn't require relative to testing. What I do know is that the Cannabis Quality Control Program authorizing legislation does include cannabis and cannabis products, and so currently our action limits apply to those products despite us not being the regulatory authority. Right. Okay. So that's a good recap. And then the standard operating procedures. I don't know where that's at. Kerry said he was going to do it. If he needed help, he was going to let me know. Okay, okay. We do, on our website, we do have, um, I guess it depends on at what point, you know, like are we test, we're probably only testing products. This is, a, I, guess, I guess it's an open question um, whether or not the Cannabis Control Board will, will require only testing of final products and not necessarily earlier in this stage you know like obviously businesses can have business agreements to do testing so that they can formulate products and they can require that products go through certain tests so that they're clean when you're making a product but are we only testing final products for all of these action levels and leaving the business relationship to deal with what's before the final product or I thought there was going to be some random testing of flour and that yeah Okay, that's entirely possible. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, that the agency would do during their audit process of the, of the, you know, on site. Yeah. As they were looking at, as they were looking at as these suppliers were sending their product to, for sale, that should get, get done at some point in time. Okay, okay. Um, so, uh, 
And I don't know if it was based on your audits that you were going to start off or what your program for auditing was going to be set structured as. Yeah. So you were hiring new auditors and things like that. So the agency does, um, we have we do inspections um, and we touch approximately 20% of our registrations on a registrants on a given year and that inspection includes review of records. So we operate under a trust but verify system um, and we make sure that they're, you know, we evaluate whether or not they're doing the right testing and whether or not their results are accurate and if they're not, you know, what our next steps are with respect to that. Sometimes you can mitigate or remediate a crop if, you know, and it can go through additional testing as it gets further processed. So, so anyway, we address the facts of the situation. Um, we provide compliance assistance through letters and then we follow up with those registrants that otherwise have had issues. Um, because our goal is compliance, is people meeting the agency where we are relative to our regulations. Um, the, I had a, a thought and now I've lost it. Um, oh, regarding um, sampling procedures. So um, we do have the standard operating, or we have procedures for sampling both crops uh, in the field, which is based on USDA's requirements, which isn't necessarily applicable to um, cannabis. And then we also have a process for sampling um, concentrate and obviously packaged products. You know, we would just grab those off the shelf, or not grab them, but we would take them as packaged. Um, but in order to get a consistent sample of a, a larger volume of material, we have written a process for that, um, specifically as it relates to hemp. So I just wanted to offer that. As yeah, I've read, I've read those. Yep. Yep, I've seen those, and you talk about you know incremental sampling and providing um, a re in terms of getting a representative sample. Yep. There's some you know randomness associated with how you're doing that, and that yep. that's just as extra important when you get to recreational marijuana. But they do, you know, there is batch, I mean, I'm not sure how much, um, there's batch processing of recreational marijuana that has to happen prior to it even getting to a, a shelf, you know, for sale. Yep. And, and I think that you know we talked about it some but not really in much detail yeah and i you know i don't know like if it's gonna you know um certainly there is value in evaluating um for contaminants the a concentrate level um we do it in the hemp program because we just we want we, we try to establish at which point made the most sense and, and because individuals are generally um, when they register they register as both growers and processors so that in many instances they're in control of everything along the spectrum that they can kind of pick and make a decision as to when it is most cost effective for them to test um, and then again the overlay of USDA which addresses potency um, which we don't have much choice on <laughs> um, so we so so we do have a little bit of flexibility in there um, for those individuals that are control in control of every step along the process. Um, I think in a cannabis world where there will be manufacturers or processors that are creating the concentrates that may be sold to another individual um, or another business who makes final products. I, I think I don't if the Cannabis Control Board wants to fill the void to ensure that what's transferring between those two entities meets certain standards, they could require testing of a concentrate before it gets sold to the next step in the level, uh, uh, next step in the process. But it, it could also be the business relationship, you know, it could be the business to business relationship where the person who's purchasing is making the concentrate producer to do those tests so that they're ensured of getting something that's of a specific quality, quantity, potency, so that they can formulate their products too. So, and I, you know, it just depends on 
how the board wants to set that up. And if that doesn't make sense, then I, you know, I would please share other ideas about that. <laughs> um, you know, like sometimes I get my mind set on a particular um, spectrum of work, and there's probably other um, potential ways that it can roll. So I would appreciate any additional comments from others. <laughs> so can I ask a question? What do you feel, because hemp isn't necessarily smoked the way that flour will be smoked on the recreational level, where, I mean, it would, as I understand, the percentage of maybe flour that's tested is very different in the hemp world than it is in the um, recreational world. Correct. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's possible. We actually have a pretty, in Vermont, a, a number of our producers do grow for flour um, to create pre-rolls, a smokable product. And so we do, you know, that's a, um, a shorter process, obviously, like your trimming, that's probably it. Um, uh, and we do require testing for contaminants before it goes to market for a flour product. Because that, that makes sense. There's yeah, no, yeah, that's what I'm, I'm mostly yeah. concerned with pesticides, if, yep. you know, and are they being required to produce, you know, and if they had a pesticide detection, would you be notified? Or is it upon yourself to find that notification? Or do they Absolutely. send you results? I, uh, we don't receive results on a regular basis. To confirm, we do have action limits for pesticides that would have to be tested for prior to um, a smokable, and they would have to meet our action limits um, before that smokable product would make it to market. Um, and I can't recall off the top of my head whether or not we require notification on that if it exceeds the limits. Um, I, I know we do for po. I think we do for flour. Um, for no, potency, for you have to. Yeah. yeah, I know you have to for potency, but I wasn't sure if there was any notification for pesticides or could it fall through the cracks that it just gets out there. Um, I mean, well, I mean, regardless of what the hemp program does, um, certainly the Cannabis Control Board could require the providing of that information for review prior to products making it to shelves. I mean, that could be a requirement um, that, uh, you know, obviously there would have to be a system in place that makes it efficient for everybody involved. Um, yeah, because I, I, I know I know even right now with, pro, with potency in products that are on the shelf, there is a place on the label that says you can call this lab to get the actual test. So, I mean, I've done that before. I've called the lab and actually got results from some lab in Massachusetts. It was Kabusha that was on the shelf in Hunger Mountain Co-op. And we were curious, you know, because it, it said on the label, oh, this is approximately below the level for potency, but if you want to get the result, you can call this, call this facility. This lab. Well, that's interesting. Yeah. Cause I, I uh, um, and the lab sent me the results. Sent you the results. Yeah. I mean, that's that's putting the the information sharing is outside of the regulatory agency. Right. Yeah. And that could be a marketing thing from a company perspective, but that doesn't, you know, but that same idea could be applied with the Cannabis Control Board, it would, unless the board had requirements for labs to report results based on batch or process lot numbers in association with the issuance of their registration from right. the Cannabis right. Control Board, it would be, um, it would have to be a requirement for that communication to occur. And that, and that I don't, you know, I don't know the willingness of labs um, to provide that information. They may feel that they have a client relationship we got client client um yep. privilege yep. relationship i mean there's definitely going to be something there but they i mean that's the kind of thing you want to allow to happen you know if yeah if you want a client to be transparent 
Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Then, and it also puts the burden on the lab to provide that information and make it available. Like whether or not the Cannabis Control Board wants to be the one that's in charge of that based on process lot numbers, you know, like. Yeah. Two, right? or, um, yeah. or it could be part of a label review. Like that's another thing. Um, we don't yes. do that in the hemp program, but as a part of a label review, you could require both the label and all documentation that testing was completed by process lot number to be made available to the CCD and that product registered with the CCD before it actually makes it to the shelf. And that would be a way um, for that review to take place. And we don't do that in the hemp program, but that is certainly something that you know the CCD could assemble. I see Sherman's hands up. I, I also want to say that we have discussed putting a QR code on, on a, a label that can link to you know, the full panel suite of tests that a product is on. Nice. Nice. Go ahead, Chairman. Well, yeah, um, thank you very much. Um, one of my responsibilities in medicinal genomics is to read regulations from as many states as I, I can. And the one thing that I have noted is that most, but not all states require that whatever batch is being tested is held until the certificate of analysis is, is completed. And that if there is any analyte in which the action level has been exceeded, it's required by, by rules that the laboratory reports it to the regulatory agency so that some action can be taken. Uh, the second point is that I've also noted that some regulatory agencies, through their seed to sale tracking system, every certificate of analysis from every laboratory is submitted. Now, of course, it all depends on funding for the regulatory body and the personnel that you have. But one issue in many states is a concept called lab shopping, especially in the cannabis world. And so real time analysis, or as frequently as you can, is to look at the certificate analysis and see uh, the failure rate and all kinds of things and that you can catch laboratories that are definitely not doing the right thing. So this is a couple of comments um, to start with and and also you know concerning PT programs or proficiency testing programs for hemp programs and cannabis programs there are issues um, since the cannabis is um, you know a more complex chemically than hemp in terms of the higher levels of cannabinoids and so forth and so on. Uh, I have issues with um, PT programs utilizing hemp as a specimen sample and I know that because it's federally illegal for cannabis it's so much harder to have PT programs using cannabis as your um, sample type. So. There's a lot of things to really consider. Yes. Um, on that front, like, I guess maybe based on the fact that Vermont is relatively small to our four corners of the state, um, and we do have a, a, a lab, um, and we actually started a process, and I'm just, you know, thinking out loud here, I, I can't commit our lab um, to anything, um, but we had started a process of creating an interlaboratory study. Um, where we would create the homogenized sample within our lab um, and then, you know, because it was going to be hemp, we were going to use U.S. mail um, and ship it out to the labs that were interested in participating. Um, and then it, it wouldn't, um, we would just look and see, you know, on the, the curve as to where everybody sat and then we would also request some information regarding their, their processes and sample prep to see if we can, you know, dial in what might actually be a better process. Um, Maybe I'm representing that not entirely accurately. I actually don't work in a lab, um, and so I apologize if I'm talking outside my scope of understanding. But <laughs> so, so um, what I hear you saying yeah, is, you're no, you're <laughs> so what I hear you saying is you're going to actually create the PT sample 
that the lab is looking into creating the proficiency testing sample for him. We, so we didn't want to say it was a proficiency test. It was an interlaboratory study because there, I think proficiency test meant a very specific thing that we probably were not able to achieve, but we were still going to do a survey or you know, amongst right, labs right. that were interested okay. with a homogenized sample to begin with. Yes, yes. Right, there's a certain ISO certification that an organization must have 17043 to be able to have a proficiency program and the only company that has a cannabis based proficiency proficiency testing program is a company named Venova. Uh, they have one staff, his name is Ty Garber, and so states make contracts with Venova. He flies to one of the governmental laboratories in that state. Then cannabis is procured. He has a way of mixing and matching, and he's created one, uh, PTs for cannabinoids, I think pesticides and metals, he hasn't quite gotten to my, microbials and he's out on extended leave. Uh, not Because I, I wanted to ask him what he was going to bring online in microbial one, but I'm sure that's very expensive because once he makes the, the, the test, blind samples, he actually has to transport them in his own vehicle to the different laboratories. And so I, I've been in the game since 2011. So I thought Absolute had it also. They don't have them. I thought I know they advertise that they do. Oh. I think that uh, what we are really looking at the whole regulatory uh, landscape for PTs, and um, <laughs> SI is a company they advertise it, but they are hemp samples. And that's not the same thing. I come from the diagnostic world, from the clinical chemistry yeah, yeah. of the OH, and so we're used to getting specimen or sample types that mimic what we actually test in our laboratory. I was, I was with N, uh, New Jersey Department of Health for 20 years and so I expect the same thing eventually for the uh, cannabis space. So many individuals that are writing these regulations without thinking through everything, they just write rules like it's a mature industry and it isn't. But I'm just trying to point these things out and participate in the dialogue and make point these things out because it's causing problems for our company. We're based no. utilizing molecular technologies and all the PTs like at NSI, they're for plating, you know, auger plating. It puts us at a great disadvantage. We're just trying to make a level playing field, that's all. Thank you. Um, did were there other? Does Kyle? Do you do you have any questions that I'm um, missing? Again, I, I no. I, I I just want to make sure you guys have information that you need, and and if you wanted to ask questions from the. I can provide answers from the hemp world perspective. No, I, I appreciate you being here. I know, you know, you can only answer what you know. <laughs> I would say, just, just Kim, for your reference, and I think we need to loop in Carrie, there's multiple times where Stephanie had said, if the CCB wants to do this, if the CCB wants to do that, um, I'm, trying, I'm trying to take notes on, on those specific inflection points. But just as we've done other subcommittees, it would be great to get a recommendation from this subcommittee on those specific points and how we should approach certain things. Um, just because, you know, the three of you and, and Carrie are really the, the quote unquote experts as it relates to this. And I feel like I don't want to be uh, making a decision without a recommendation on how to proceed. You know what I mean? Well, and yeah, and so one of the items that I heard um, 
that I, I may have said that related to, and I think um, Sherman actually offered, um, you know, through review of multiple regulations requiring a staff person at a um, regulatory staff person to review all the COAs um, prior to a project hitting a product hitting the shelf based on that process lot number. And so while I mean that sounds amazing, like you would have the review and compliance would have to be achieved before something hit the shelf. Um, and that's probably a rigorous process that needs staff. So while, you know, it, that seems like a great recommendation, there's there's this other piece of people that, you know, that and, and, um, and volume of products that I don't know that I could, you know, that I would be able to provide weigh in on, I guess, is, you know, where it also comes into play. But maybe there's, like, if we took a step back, what's, if, if that couldn't happen because it required a couple of people, um, um, or what that process looks like. We actually don't know what that process looks like. Is there something that's not quite as rigorous, but um, provides the same, a similar level of review or enough eyes um, to, to make both the consuming public and the regulated community um, step up? And I, I, so I'm asking that question because I don't know the answer, but I'm wondering if Sherman has any suggestions. Oh. Yeah, it, this is just, this is, you know, I, I, I'm from government. I understand. Okay, I really do. Um, and you got to start where you can, but eventually you might want to consider what they did in Washington and Nevada. It was more of a retrospective. There was a laboratory scientist out of the state of Washington who requested through the public information acts in each of those states to be able to, after it was uh, all the um, information was de-identified, but at least it said lab A, lab B, so forth and so on, able to get, let's say, six months worth of COAs. Then he had to wait to analyze it. So he broke through in the state of Nevada and he noted that one particular laboratory over that period of time did not fail a single sample. While the average of failure rate was 10% for all the other laboratories. So that says something. So then there was an investigation of that laboratory. That's what I'm talking about. And then certain, and then there was like an average THC level. And so there would be certain labs that had three or 4% more on the average. So what's going on here? So these are the pieces, of, it's like deep mining to see trends and possible gaps. Because you want to have the good players really buy the testing to protect the public. I come from public health, you know, so that's what I was talking about. And, the, 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 you know, I got into regulations as a hobby at the Department of Health. It wasn't an assignment. And to make this compendium and update it five times for all the states that had rules for testing, they compiled and did observational and gap analysis. And, and uh, the point that you made about the concentrate, this is just your example that might be processed by one company and would then be transferred to another company to make like, um, um, an infused product, um, you know, one might want to consider testing that before it's transferred and not make it a business business relationship because we did a, like um, a gap analysis for pesticides and we did the best we could to go through the literature, uh, peer reviewed literature, non peer reviewed literature, and from government documents to find every pesticide that had been identified that had been in at least one marketed cannabis products and I found, we found 25 pesticides. Then we looked at what pesticides are required for testing from all the states. I found nine pesticides that was not tested in any states. I just wanted to try to just educate 
the regulators from all the cannabis programs throughout the United States of America that, that, you know, by doing this kind of analysis, one can, you know, uh, look at one's own list of pesticides and consider adding additional pesticides, things like that. that. That was simply my hobby. And so since now I work for a company focused just on microbial, um, I'm really honing in on that. And one concern I do have is simply a phrase I found in one of the minutes for one of, one of your meetings, Kim, and that was looking at the Oregon testing rules, the required testing rules, and we had done a comprehensive comparative analysis in 2019. COVID-19 shut me down. I was going to just continue every year. But in 2019, at the end of the summer, in our version 5.0, there were 27 states that required microbial testing. Believe it or not, there were 16 distinct combinations of required testing. It was all over the place. And so, you know, what is the most science-based reasoning behind what you required? And, you know, I have my opinions, other people have their own opinions, but I would hate to have a required test in which you got the result and it gave no information on whether the cannabis sample had any microorganisms that were dangerous to human health for a patient or a consumer. And Oregon was a, quite an outlier. Um, I don't, they're in the process of actually changing their uh, required for microbial and um, they only had coliform they actually said that they only required one test total coliforms and not all and, and any microbiologist knows it's not all coliforms um, are pathogenic and so you know i've been favorable as i've said in all my documents i've sent to you is the you know it's Required testing for known pathogens that have been found in cannabis. I, I agree with you, but the difficulty lies is that the laboratories that can do some of these other microbial tests are not available. I mean, or you they're extremely costly, cost, costly. Because the, even with living on a dairy farm, I mean, we're only testing for E. coli because it's the indicator compound. It is an indicator that there's something going awry. And, and so I can see where you're, yeah, that, that right. that's a big concern. Well, but I do have to admit that at least Oregon looks for all of those 25 pesticides. <laughs> right, they, they have a, one of the longest lists. Uh, but in terms of microbial, how we've overcome that being, I've done plating all the way to whole genome sequencing and medicinal genomics has, has multiplexed. So the six tests, the four aspergillus pathogenic species, all salmonella species, and Steck E. coli, you just run two tests, that's it. And um, the, the aspergillus multiplex test is now um, certified by AOAC and our South Stack certification will be achieved by the end of the year. And you just run two tests. That gives you all the information. And just want to mention that. And how, how, what's the cost of those now? Well, I'm just curious. Well, that's the thing is I'm not on that end of things. I've only been with MGC since May. Um, and also when you asked about cost, I used to do cost analysis for you know, my laboratory in New Jersey, and it's just not the cost of the reagent, but it's the labor and everything, and they oh, yeah. haven't really done that analysis. I developed a template for the Association of Public Health Laboratories of how to determine a cost per test, 
taking in consideration of every parameter you can think of down to the number of paper towels that you use. Yeah. And so oh, it's pretty amazing when it comes down to that. And a lot of sales people from various competing companies will throw some cost down per test, but they, um, you know, it turns out to be a lot more once you, you know, and also turnaround time is important and so forth and so on, but I can get you that information. It might be interesting to get that because we did right. get a summary of what the other tests were costing, but okay. we didn't include yeah. so much on the microbial right. costs. Yeah. Right, when it comes to microbial, uh, plating seems to be cheaper, but the labor. Yeah, the yeah. Product, labor yeah. really is the largest component because you've got to include their benefits. And it's not easy in a production laboratory. I mean, I don't, what does the agency have for testing, Stephanie, on that side of things? Uh, I can't, I don't know, I can't answer that question. I don't work in the laboratory. What I can say, though, is that um, they, the agency's laboratory, while um, from the hemp perspective, again, I can only <laughs> talk about that. I'm that yeah. one, um, is they are um, certified by the Kansas Quality Control Program to do the moisture analysis um, and the potency test. They are working on the microbial testing um, and developing their method and validating their methods at this point in time and hopefully by next year we'll have um, they'll have actually the complete suite of tests that are needed um, for the hemp program you know solvents um, microbial testing and um, uh, pesticides and so forth but I mean but the, the lab does do I mean they have it's a lab that does lots of different tests um, relative to dairy feed seed for you know like they do a lot of tests um, I just don't know I can't. Which one? Yeah, yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah, I worked actually, um, Sherman, I worked with the Department of Health in New Jersey when we were doing 524.2 analysis, 524.1 analysis, looking for turf butyl alcohol, and the labs were falsifying that they could see it. <laughs> <laughs> which, uh, Kim, which agency in New Jersey was that? It was the Department of Health. I don't know. Oh, the we Health. Well, that would be yeah, yeah. environmental laboratories. Yeah, this was way back in probably the 90s. Uh, because I it, yeah, they I were it. telling us that we had to have a reporting limit of 10 ppb, and I said, there's no way you can see it at 10 ppb. And they're like, well, all our labs are seeing it that. And I'm like, well, then all your labs are falsifying the data. And I recovered that. I, I found that out for us. And then yeah. it finally changed to 50 ppb because that was the concentration at which we could see it. Right. I um, totally understand that. Yeah, the um, the hemp program is also um, Sherman. You had mentioned earlier about falsifying lab or not falsifying, but um, and, and looking at labs and looking at their data to determine whether or not um, lab shopping is occurring. I guess um, or the forthrightness of the lab. And we have started kind of like our um, our on-site. We call it like a like an on-site investigation kind of process um, and it's still we're still working on it um, but to look at that that very thing like look at random test results and determining um, or even successive because <laughs> sometimes you don't really go that far <laughs> just, it's the same thing for you know the runs are all the same and all the, the data is the same um, so so we we do we are kind of putting that process together um, for the labs that we certify because we know that you know it's not it's not enough just to be certified, but you also have to do inspections and um, and, and be um, consistent in the inspections that you're conducting. So that's why we're putting together the process so it's always the, the same, generally, that we're looking for information. Right, yeah, and also there's the forthrightness of the cultivator, too, because it's yeah. THC is king in the cannabis world, and there's been known instances of lightly spraying 
one's can cannabis flower with diluted um, THC solution to increase the, the analysis so that they can put a higher concentration on the label. Um, but the thing is that certain strains of cannabis is known to have a range of THC. So one particular lab director sent his staff around to different dispensaries and bought, let's just say, Blue Dream, like 20 samples, you know, and that certain ones came from certain dispensaries, like 5% higher than all the other Blue Dreams. So there's something going on, or, you know, um, it was advertised 5% higher than it actually was. Uh, but when it was tested at the laboratory, that's when they lightly sprayed, you know, their lot. <laughs> there's a lot of, uh, yeah, yeah, there's a lot of stuff yeah. going on. Uh, yeah. Just to be aware of it, that's all. Yeah, I like the idea, and, and the board might think about this, is um, requiring a COA of by batch of, of some sort, either going to some, I mean, even if you had to have a third party regulatory like agency, I don't know, you, you know, we have to have that all the time for any um, standards in the laboratory world anyway. So to ensure that, you know, when you're looking for chlorinated solvents, the standard that you're using is of some known purity in order to make sure that the concentrations are coming out right when you're providing data to, you know, in the real world. So I think that's a really good idea to think about. I'm not, I know that it's a manpower issue, but even if it's filed somewhere where you could go and call it, you know, just like it costs you more money to get a COA with a standard per se, but if you had the ability that those COAs were filed with the laboratory and you could call on it to look at if you had some concerns. Um, to tease that out a little bit, um, because I think I'm a little out of my depth, but I want to use the words that I, that I want to make sure I'm going to repeat what you said so that I understand it. Um, the, the, it, it's the standard by which the actual test is the, THC test is being run, so there's the Blue Dream or whatever THC, but then there's the standard that it's that the equipment is compared against. Is that am I is that right? And that that standard is consistent, and that COA for that standard is available for inspection at the lab. Is that what you're? Maybe I'm not saying that right. Well, well so. I, I, I brought up two subjects, so I probably oh. shouldn't have done that. So one, the certificate of analysis that comes, say, for a flower uh, or a yeah. potency of, of, it comes from the laboratory and is shipped back to the product owner and says, here's what I need for my standard. It's compliant with all of these things. You know, it's the right potency, it has no pesticides, blah, blah, blah. So it's certifying that this product is X. Yep. What I was okay. saying is that we require, you know, analytical laboratories when they buy a standard for whatever test you might be using, whether you're testing for cannabis or potency, um, you for THC, you buy that standard to run your tests against, and that is required to have a COA to ensure that the potency test is being run with a known concentration purity standard. You know, I guess that's the better way to put it. Okay, okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. I mean, I'm just, um, I, I wanted to understand that second piece. Yeah, yeah, Why sorry. The first piece, um, the second piece more, um, from the perspective of that, the agency has that certification program, and if we don't, and I don't have all the details in my head, but if we don't actually require that second piece, that could be something that we might want to consider adding, or um, it would right. be a additional requirement that a recommendation to the CCB that labs maintain that information. Um, right. For review. Right. So, yeah. For review. Okay. 
And um, I just want to quickly mention, you know, more and more states are adding, um, I mean, many states already had Sal and Stack, but now 12 states have the four Aspergillus pathogens. Colorado uh, is, uh, they drafted rules. I went to their hearing just the other day, and so that looks like that's going to be put in place in July. So I did find a document from actually a consultant in the Vermont Medical Cannabis Program first got started. And the Vermont consultant recommended, I believe, Salstec in the four aspergillus, but I guess it was never considered. I, it was way before my time. But I, I, I've been digging into the historical developments in Vermont best I can. We do have a copy of that doc. I think it's from 2016. It was produced by um, Via Diagnostics and another lab out of Waterbury, I think. I don't remember the name of that lab. Um, yes, I, we are aware, or I am aware of that document. I can sure, certainly share um, that information with the CCB. Thanks, Stephanie. It's 1255, our, 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 our yep. friend uh, who joined us from the public left. Um, so there's no public comment, but I just I, I, would, I think it would be helpful for myself and for, and for Bryn. And Bryn, I know you've been talking to Carrie, um, just to kind of understand where things are in the process. Kim, I know you're waiting on some draft SOP, and this is forming the basis. This isn't necessarily forming our proposed rule per se, but the basis for the CCB to look at as a proposal from you, Kim, and Carrie, the subcommittee. And so I just want to, yeah. yeah, I know you kind of alluded to where things were at the beginning, but in terms of producing like a tangible document with recommendations, I'm hoping you could, you could refresh my memory on, on where things are. I know you're waiting from, I know you're waiting from information from Carrie on SOPs. Is that correct? Um, that was, I mean, what I'm, I'm not completely um, on board with what they're expecting from me for a document. I thought we were going to mirror image kind of what the hemp program was doing. And then so you basically have your standard documentation, but with some added um, emphasis on, on the um, sampling and you know what he needs at the agency for assistance you know what i mean he was developing what what the agency was actually looking for to ramp up their own program to cover the recreational side of things okay so <clears throat> so it sounds like yep so yeah. so my understanding is that um you're waiting on some SOP recommendations from Carrie. And once you have those and you've done your review um, and comparison with the Oregon SOPs and, and your like the, the inclusion of your recommendations, we should come back together for another meeting. Um, does that Yeah, I think that I think that's true for an action item and then what what are you looking for from Carrie and I has documentation to support you going forward? Because as I understand, there's quite the documentation in the hemp, hemp program is going to be very similar to the documentation in the recreational program, and maybe talking about a few more requirements like maybe a COA to be on file or for a product or a flower that gets tested and it be available upon request from a particular laboratory. I, I don't know. Are, are that, is that what you're looking at? I mean, that, just that's what that's what I'm just going to chime in. That that's kind of some of those types of recommendations is also what I would find very helpful. Some of the the testing requirements before or after it's transferred or a business to business relationship. How should we proceed as a board for those types of inflection point decision makings that we're going to need? Again, because I want to make sure I fully understand. Um, recommendations that would be coming from you, Kim, and, and Stephanie, and Carrie, and the hemp program. And, and Sherman, I'm sure that a lot of your comments will be sprinkled throughout the conversation again. 
I want to make it clear that, that they're not proposing the rule at this point in time. It's just a direction for the board to go. So I'm not expecting, Kim, that the whole rule, quote unquote, be you know, fully, fully written as such. It's, it's, it's pretty directional okay. at this point, and, and we can kind of work through certain things. And Sherman, I'm sure you're, you've been very helpful in this. Sorry. Uh, that's okay. I didn't know what it was coming from. Um, I'm sorry, but that's my phone. Yeah, there'll be. This is like the the start of the process, not the end of the process. So there'll be opportunities right, okay. to comment, refine, so on and so forth as we go. But it's these kind of inflection point recommendations on how we should proceed at this point. Okay, sounds good. And I am. Um, I have a document from the woman that I who has worked with the cannabis industry through the Department of Health now is on her own and does auditing under 17025, all these things. She wrote up a document on um, the industry specific risks and challenges that I'm gonna forward on to the board for review. It just identifies, you know, where, what's happened in Colorado, the differences in other states, not requiring certain tests, you know, the, the whole fact that every state is doing their own thing. And what are we gonna do when the federal government finally legalizes this? Right. <laughs> and we're, you know, we wanna make sure that we aren't off on our own tangent because you wanna be able to roll it into the regulation, the federal regulated community Absolutely. at some point in time. That makes Please. sense. I think I think we'll follow up with Carrie to try and get you that information as expeditiously as we can because I don't really want to wait another month and a half to have another one of these meetings. I don't think we can we can afford to given our timelines coming fast and furious out of okay. the spring. Okay. Okay. Uh, I want to thank everyone for this opportunity to dialogue with you, and I'm available at any time uh, to continue the dialogue and. I hope that you'll allow me to be included in future meetings. And Kim, I'll get you those. Boss, yeah, you can forward cost. it to all of us, the okay. cost estimates. All right, great. That Thank sounds you. great. And then the other action items, I guess, I'm, I don't think there's any other actions that Stephanie's gonna work with Carrie to keep moving forward. I'm gonna send off this specific risks and challenges and be patient and and we'll go from there sounds great Sherman do you have Kim's email do you have all the emails that you need yeah I think so because there was well maybe I should get I think uh, let me see confirmation of exactly which emails I should send to because I got the invite and the invite have just a bunch of people and I don't want to send whatever I send to the wrong people. Okay? Does that sound okay with everybody? Yeah. Um, mine's, pr mine's pretty easy because it's K Watson 45, so at AOL. Have, I'll, I'll coordinate getting um, email addresses, right. and this is Nellie. I'll coordinate getting email addresses yeah. and, uh, and disseminating all that right. information. Right. Yeah. On the last thing that Nellie said, there's only eight of us on it anyway, so and you're one of them. Right. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I so. Appreciate that, Nellie. And then, um, yeah, I might send you a presentation I recently gave to um, AFTO, one of the regulators from the food and drug industry concerning cannabis, and kind of like a landscape type presentation. I'll include that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. All we'll right. be in touch about scheduling this follow-up. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.